online and uh, have your mute off. Uh, a couple questions for you. Okay. First off, uh, you've responded in the chat box to some of the greenhouse gas questions, but uh, not everybody may have seen those. So I'm just going to uh, ask those again. Um, first off, animals produce greenhouse gases in a number of ways, um, including CO2 when they breathe and methane when cattle uh, ruminate. ruminate. Uh, and then also from manure, are all those um, sources of greenhouse gas production included in the emissions numbers and will they be also considered, all those sources be considered when um, reporting requirements come? Um, let me just say that we're in the process of trying to determine that and certainly uh, we're looking at all, all the sources there, the CO2 and the methane. Of course, the methane would be the primary one at, at those particular sources. However, um, I think if, if, if we do require uh, any CAFOs to report under that, it will be because we set a threshold and, and they exceed that threshold. And one of the things that we've looked at in doing some analyses has been the um, IPCC's work on how you estimate emissions from those sources based on their different uh, configurations and stuff. So if you're interested in seeing what's been done, that's one thing that we've looked at uh, there. We wouldn't necessarily be, di be dictating how a person estimated those emissions, but I know that there's a, an extensive chapter or so um, in, that, in that document on that. Um, does that answer the question? When the proposal comes out uh, will be when we will go public with, you know, who might be included and, and not. A follow-up question to that is, uh, is that if agriculture is contributing only 8% of greenhouse gas emissions, um, is there the possibility that, that um, they might be exempted because they're such a small portion of the Yes, there's always that possibility and in looking at some preliminary numbers, on the, only the largest of the large, if, if say the threshold was 25,000 uh, metric tons equivalent of CO2, I, there would be um, very few uh, animal feeding operations I think that would be triggered by that. Uh, we would not be looking at anything else that might be happening on the farm. I think in terms of the, um, when you're looking at the production area and the manure management in, in that reference I just mentioned, uh, they don't get into the land application um, as well. So we do have some ability to distinguish between certain types of operations that we might not request be included and certainly I think the threshold will be the largest uh, indicator and then the other thing would be the, the feasibility the, uh, uh, of being even able to determine emissions. For example, uh, the N2O from uh, crop production and everything, I, I don't think we would we even want to get into that at, at this point. I don't know that we have the capability uh, to, to make those estimates or, or think it would be worthwhile to do that. And certainly there's recognition that agriculture is a, is a small uh, percentage of that and, and all of these factors are being considered as we develop the rulemaking. Sally, you uh, had mentioned or uh, given a response in the chat box about uh, California's greenhouse rule AB32. Mm -hmm. uh, can you summarize that? Also, again, and can you also, uh, do you have any information on a California study on beef feedlots being done, uh, I assume, uh, related to that study? No, I don't have, it. in response to that last question, I don't have any information on their, their study on the feedlots. I, um, but on the AB32, I know that the team that's working on this greenhouse gas rulemaking uh, have reached out to a number of the states who have programs already in place, reporting programs in place. Uh, we're trying to uh, pick the best from those. Obviously, I don't think we could be consistent with every program because they're all a little bit different. We're looking also at what's been done on the international uh, scale as well. So we're trying to uh, learn from those programs, if you will, and, and then put try to put something in place that hopefully won't uh, duplicate or won't uh, upend those state programs that might be already in place. 
But I know that we did. We are looking or have looked at the California program. I just don't know how they'll compare. Sally, this question's for me. Uh, one of your slides said that participants, I'm assuming that meant the consent agreement, must comply within 120 days after the name right. the results are in. Right. Uh, is that a correct interpretation of participants? And what about non-participants? The participants must comply. And what compliance would mean in, in terms of this would mean if, if they were above the 100 pounds per day of ammonia or hydrogen sulfide, then they would have to report to those centers that I mentioned within that 120 days. If they meet the thresholds of major source for permitting requirements under the Clean Air Act, and by permitting requirements, I'm talking about the Title V operating permit and the NSR PSD thresholds, uh, either or of those, then they would have to submit their permit application within 120 days. So they have to start the process. Obviously, if their requirements are triggered by that are triggered by the NSD. NSR PSD permitting, such as you know, batch or layer, then they would be entering into negotiations with the states on those uh, as part of the permit process. But the main thing would be to get that permit application in. Uh, Non-participants, uh, if they meet those thresholds now, uh, they should go ahead and, and uh, re either report or submit a permit application uh, to EPA. Uh, so they're. They don't have any kind of protection from EPA uh, if we came out and determined that they exceeded those thresholds. Uh, we're probably not going to bother the, the participants in the consent decree or even go look and see if they exceed those thresholds until after we get the study done. But the non-participants are at risk from enforcement actions from EPA. Uh, citizen suits, of course, can occur anywhere, anytime. I'm just going to ask uh, one more set of questions for you, Sally, and then shift over to Al. Um, a couple uh, new areas. One is total reactive nitrogen, and then the other is methanol. Can you give a quick summary of where we're heading in those? Right. Methanol is, is a hazardous air pollutant. Uh, I know that there have been a number of lawsuits, uh, two or three that I'm aware of, where um, citizens have sued dairies for failing to report. Uh, their methanol emissions. Uh, EPA does not have any action uh, ongoing uh, in terms of setting any kind of max standards for CAFOs. We haven't listed them as a source category. And uh, I don't think we have enough information at this point in time uh, on methanol emis emissions to move forward uh, in any way. I also don't know what we would do to try to control them. Uh, in terms of, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Total reactive nitrogen. Reactive nitrogen. Uh, the only thing that we're moving on is right now, and in, in terms of a regulatory sense, is the review of the nitrogen dioxide standard. Uh, I think in some discussions with our legal counsel, there would be um, issues if we tried to look at a total reactive nitrogen or ammonia as an indicator for nitrogen oxides. Uh, at this time and moving forward. Uh, I, but I do know that that had been discussed uh, as part of the, the process. I, the integrated nitrogen assessment, I'm not familiar with all of its conclusions. Uh, you can find information on, on our website under the scientific advisory board or the science advisory board and what that committee has, has put out to date. I do know that they're recommending that we look uh, into that more, and certainly the um, uh, with the hypoxia report that has come out, there's just a lot of concern about the nitrogen uh, runoff, the nitrogen deposition, and uh, it look it seems like to me that the case is is building for, for the agency, uh, and certainly the science seems to be pushing us towards looking at it in a more comprehensive manner. Uh, and then on the international front, total reactive nitrogen seems to be where the focus is uh, as opposed to just one particular aspect of that equation. Thank you, Sally. I may come back to you, but I've uh, got a couple questions for Al. Okay, thanks. Uh, first off, um, fed ammonia or fed nitrogen in the ration can affect 
ammonia uh, emissions and your selection of barns and sites looking more so looking at uh, region and type of building how are you accommodating or are you accommodating for ration effects uh, good question we, we are uh, documenting the the feed input the nutrient input into the farm and also the output through the through the manure uh, through sampling and and also uh, obtaining information from the producer is there Is there any attempt to bring in uh, nearby ambient monitors, um, data that be, maybe be, be being recorded there into the study? Okay, uh, some ambient monitors that might be there for, because of the state monitoring program. Uh, no, we, this is a source uh, measuring program, and we're you know we're we're not doing that. Uh, obviously, the the concentrations measured by those ambient monitors, however far they are away from these farms. Um, would be influenced by lots of sources uh, besides besides the one that we're monitoring at. So, in fact, we haven't even considered it. Okay, one more for you, Al, and then uh, two more have come in for Sally. Maybe uh, you have uh, sonic anemometer velocity readings. Uh, yeah. Multiple points at California, Washington. Um, how are those being translated into velocity? Uh, by the equation, uh, airflow is equal to the uh, velocity through the opening times the area of the opening. And so that's the basic principle of making these measurements. The area at the California site is constant, the opening area. So we, the only thing that changes is the velocity. And then in Washington, the opening area depends on the position of the curtains, which are only changed uh, seasonally. So uh, for any given time, we, we know what the opening area is. Sally, if you're still there, there's a question came up about the emissions estimating methodologies uh, mentioned at the end of your talk. Uh, who is actually writing those or responsible for putting that information together? Uh, that's our Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards that's responsible for that. Uh, they're located at RTP, uh, Robin Duncan's group. Uh, is responsible, and Bill Schrock is uh, her primary lead on that and working very closely with Al on, on the monitoring study as well. Okay. Uh, there are, uh, I think we're getting most of the questions that are in the chat box, so if you have any more, please uh, enter them now so we uh, don't miss your question. Uh, Sally, you put a note in the chat box about um, APO versus CAFO for one of the uh, part of your talk. Do you want to reiterate that orally? Yes. Um, if I um, when I reference CAFOs in term in the context of CERCLA and EPCRA and in the Clean Air Act, I probably should have said APHOs um, because all of them are subject. It just depends on the amount of missions and whether there are applicable requirements to them. Uh, regardless of size. Uh, under the Clean Water Act, as you know, there is a distinction made between AFOs and CAFOs, and the effluent guidelines are for CAFOs. Uh, the rulemaking they're doing applies to the uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, and they've uh, determined what, they've defined those for the various uh, animal groups, um, and you can find that in, in their information there. Um, so. I hope that helps clarify that question. No, APHOs would definitely be open to the reporting requirements if exactly. they're not exempted. Depending on how, how much their emissions are and if they cross certain thresholds. Okay, a follow-up question for Al. Um, you just gave a summary of how you determine the ventilation rate. Um, follow-up question is that uh, those openings can be either inlets or outlets. Uh, how do how is that accounted for in terms of the net discharge? My speaker on mute again. Uh, yes, the ventilation. Uh, well, the direction of of, of the wind influences uh, what openings are inlets and outlets, and, and they're basically changing with the wind because the sonic anemometers are three dimensional. 
we can we can know what whether that opening is a is an inlet or an outlet, and uh, we we also know exactly the 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 angle between the the wind direction or the airflow going through that opening and the opening itself, and uh, we will use the the um, perpendicular component as the the air velocity for that opening. Now, coefficient of discharge discharge coefficient. Um, these openings are pretty large. Uh, they're probably you know 10, 12, 14 feet high. Uh, so I, I'm not uh, we, we we're assuming 1.0 at this point, uh, but we are doing some gradient measurements uh, to to help us. I, I think a, a bigger effect would be the gradient between the bottom of the opening and the top of the opening, and we're addressing that uh, through some gradient studies. As a follow-up question for, on that, uh, Al, uh, early on there was some hesitancy by the, I know the dairy industry and some of the boiler uh, groups as to being able to monitor naturally ventilated buildings. Uh, has this seemed to um, give them some confidence in some information, or where does that stand? Your, your question is related to the naturally, naturally ventilated buildings? Correct. Okay. And some hesitancy. Well, um, I, I think that uh, the uncertainty of measuring natural ventilation, naturally ventilated buildings, are are uh, are much higher. Now, was the question that they were hesitant about measuring naturally ventilated buildings, or hesitant to use data from mechanically ventilated buildings to represent natural? I think it um, related to the ability to measure capability of measuring from naturally ventilated buildings and or uh, relate mechanical over to natural. Okay, that's, that's a good question. I, I think, um, in look, well, first of all, mechanically ventilated buildings are mo more conducive to getting good data. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, it's evident by the questions that have come up about making measurements from the naturally ventilated buildings. Uh, we, we actually prefer to have a mechanically ventilated building to make the measurements. Uh, there are so many factors between the two different types of barns that are the same. Number, weight, and age of animals, the manure production, the manure pro handling system, the temperature control set point, they're all the same no matter what ventilation type you have. Now there's a couple factors that are different, but we're accounting for those, and that is manure and litter characteristics might be different between the two different types. Barn temperature and humidity might be different, but we're accounting for those because we're measuring those. And then there are some factors that could be different, but were but could be predicted through computer models, and that is the air velocity across the emitting surface and the ventilation airflow rate. Um, I, I think there's several examples of where mechanical ventilation is used to to predict naturally ventilated emission, and that would include uh, hoop structures to me measure emissions from dairy cows in California. Uh, to represent what's happening on a naturally ventilated feedlot, and, and uh, mechanical ventilation experimental setup is used uh, in order to get measurements of that. And uh, so, anyway, um, I, I, I guess, we, are there any further questions related to that, given those comments? I think I think that's sufficient. Uh, another question came in uh, regarding. Uh, a indication of, of the size based on species at which the 100 pound reporting requirements might be might be met. Uh, I think they're asking for your your crystal ball or uh, early early indications. Um, can you give a a response in terms of when that information would be available and and how you how you plan to release that information? Okay, uh, the, the information, uh, the data from the study will be available in 2011 and when EPA uh, has a chance to review the data and, and, and develop their uh, emission estimating methodologies. Uh, EPA is basically in control of, of the release of the data until about a year and a half after the end of the study when the university professors will be able to publish to their heart's delight. Um, now, that said, 
before before the study started and during the producer sign up, several universities wrote extension bulletins and to to predict based on previous data how how large the farms would need to be to generate the hundred pounds per day and, and, and those extension bulletins are, are still available. All right. At this point, I'll, I'll take if anyone has any uh, final questions, please uh, put them in the chat box. Otherwise, I encourage you to, if you haven't already done so, complete the, uh, the uh, evaluation. And, uh, and I would like to remind people that our next uh, Learning Center and Air Quality Education and Animal Agriculture webcast will be in September. And, uh, and I do want to remind people that uh, all questions um, 